What's going on, Rockfish Church? Hey, so uh, before we really get into this, uh, let's, let's, I want to go ahead and pray. We're going to talk about some more supernatural stuff tonight. Uh, it's going to have to do with, with supernatural battles and uh, dealing with, dealing with that, that spiritual warfare that we may encounter on a personal or a corporate level. Um, and so I, I can tell you right now, this sermon at 11 o'clock this morning was non-existent. It wasn't even a skeleton of a sermon. It was a pile of bones, disorganized and uh, all of a sudden, stuff just started happening, and before I knew it, three quarters of the sermon was done, and then I'd randomly get a text from Mark Autry, one of the lovely staff members here. He said, how you doing? I said, fine. He said, how's, how's that sermon coming along? I was like, hey, you know, it's doing all right, I guess. I'm oh, not quite done, and I'm feeling, you know, the pressure to get it done and turn it into them so they can do what they need to do. And uh, that's when he lets me know, like, hey, they had, they had prayed for me during devotion, devotions, and that kind of, uh, I can tell you right now, this was, this was not me that wrote the sermon today. This was, this was answered prayers that came in. This was, this was not my doing. So I just want to give thanks to God. I want to give thanks. We have a, I mean, we have a big staff, but we have a wonderful staff here that is not only supporting everybody here, but supporting uh, each other as well. And we got two pastors that should either be traveling from Chicago back home tonight or tomorrow, so we want safe travels for them. Amen. So if you guys would join me, Father God, we, uh, we thank you. You are so good and gracious. You are, you are bountiful, Lord. You give us more than we could ask for and hope for. Uh, Lord, you protect us in the times when we don't know it and the times when we beg for it. Lord, you are there. You carry us through situations that we, we see no end to, Lord. We don't understand up from down. And we just we thank you for those that you surround us with, that, that you have sent us, not just your angels, but your, your sons and daughters in this world, Lord, to, to look after each other. I pray that you would bless us tonight, that our pastors would be escorted home by you safely with their wives, Lord, and they would rejoin with their families, and they would show up at work rejuvenated, ready to take back over. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so again, we're going into um, supernatural stuff so last Wednesday, if you were lucky enough to, to see the panel that occurred, three much more educated than men uh, than me, men sat up here and talked about the armor of God, and they really maybe even gave a new perspective to a lot of you who most of us have probably heard a teaching or two on that. Um, and so when they spoke about the benefits and the necessity of their armor of God, I want to talk about why the armor of God is really necessary this week. And so... Um, as we, as we talk about free will over the weekend and us being eternal beings and we're going to end up in heaven or hell, uh, we want to stay tied to those subject, subjects. So um, we're also going to talk about our role within the war between those two, um, those two forces. So we're going to talk about the forces of heaven and hell at war. And so this is the current and future citizens of hell against the future, ci- I'm sorry, of heaven. And it's going to be bad to mess this up. All right, so the current and future citizens of heaven fighting against the future citizens of hell. Because hell is not even a thing yet. It's not a thing until God casts Satan and his, his demons down in there. Okay? So, but it's the residents of that, that's involved in this war. So there's these, these constant threats being made, moves being made, and battles being won and lost. And these are done within the supernatural, but yet the effects can be seen here in the natural. And so we're going to talk about what that looks like. And so what it looks like is, is a proxy war, but is disguised as a civil war. And what I mean by proxy war, in case you're not familiar with that term, is basically there are two larger outside forces working to puppeteer other smaller forces that are, that are moving at their behest or at their will, whether they know it or not. So these two forces have an agenda, and yet they're using smaller entities to perform their acts in this world. And so that's what it means when I say a proxy war, but it's disguised to look as a civil war. And as a country who's had a civil war, we can, um, we can totally relate to what that looks like. But so a civil war, meaning just you know, men fighting against men, brothers against brothers, or a, civili- a civilization torn apart by a war. And so there are, um, let's see here. So when we, it looks and feels like we're in a struggle against our brother, but, but what's really occurring here is, is we're in a struggle against his, that brother's master, right? 
And so that, that goes for both sides. So remember in Ephesians 6.12, I think we, they actually said it last week, but I just want to bring it right back to the surface. For a struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So keep that in mind. In, in the moment, it's very easy for us to, to squint our eyes and focus on the flesh that's before us, but that flesh is serving a supernatural power when it's coming against us, and we need to focus on how do I address the supernatural that's going on right now. So here, here, the significant difference between the two sides of this are everyone who is serving God's supernatural purpose in the natural does so knowingly. But many who are serving Satan's purpose in the natural are unwittingly doing so. Some of them are actually deceived into thinking that they are on the righteous side of the battle, that they're actually doing God's will. And this is why we are called to pray for and grant mercy to those who serve our enemy, the enemy of our father, because many of them don't realize that they even have a master that they're being enslaved to. They don't even realize they've given into his agenda. So through wisdom and discernment, we should be responding to acts of hostility with a measured response. There is no benefit to destroying what some of us might refer to as a useful idiot, somebody who's fully on board with the campaign, but they don't know who's driving the campaign. They don't know what is the envisioned end state of that campaign. They're just somebody who's fully on board. And so when we can simply disengage the natural instead of engaging in the supernatural, sometimes that's what we need to do. Most of the time, that's what we need to do. So the battle between your, is between your flesh and your spirit. And so um, for a few years here, uh, some of us were coaching sports in a sport, uh, homeschool sports league called um, Integrity Sports. And so one of the awards that we gave the kids for, uh, for each team was an actual voted on award. So we, obviously somebody got like most improved or, or MVP or what, what, we had like three awards. I can't remember what they all were. Anyway, they were for performance based, right? But the fourth award, all the teammates voted on individually, secret ballot, and they couldn't vote for themselves. And this award was the integrity award. It was, it was based on, is this kid living out the values of Jesus Christ or Christian while on the sports field, while off the sports field, hanging out with the team, whatever it may be? And so the thing I would always try and remind the kids is there's always more kids not getting the, the award than there is in a kid getting the award. I wanted to remind everybody before we gave out that award that, look, the only one you're competing with out here is you. The only thing that matters is that you have let go of a little bit of your flesh by the end of the day and you're a little bit more spiritual. Whether it's the end of the day, end of the week, of the month, end of your life, is that you are a different, more improved version of yourself because you allowed Jesus to make you that way, not because you were able to achieve it on your own. And so I'll remind you of that as well as you go through things. As we, I mean, even Pastor Jeff and Pastor Tony, I can tell you myself too, going through this series of supernatural, things just start to happen and, and work against you. Um, I'm experiencing a little bit of that. We're going to come out on top, don't get me wrong, but it, it's something we experience. And just remember not to let the flesh take over. All right? That is an opportunity to feed the spirit and silence the flesh. So God works through our spirit, and Satan tempts the flesh. And that's, that's, where, that's where this war occurs on a personal level. So there's a war among nations versus a holy war. And so there may be multiple veterans in here. Um, and so in, in 2003, we invaded Iraq, army against army. But by mid-2003, that army didn't exist in Iraq. And within a few weeks, it had turned into a holy war. And so it was one army trying to fight a a war based on regular army versus army type rules and behavior, right? But yet there's another faction, the other side, they are fighting a completely different battle. They've declared it a holy war. And something we need to keep in mind is, even when we're just trying to go throughout our day, 
there is holy war declared against you because you put on the name of Jesus Christ, right? So even though you are not out there with the intention of, man, I'm going to war today, carrying around your sword, got your shield on, got your helmet of salvation, all that stuff, right? That's not your mentality until somebody brushes you the wrong way. Point is, there are forces surrounding you on a daily basis looking for an opportunity to trip you up, and they are fighting a holy war. So you need to know and understand, recognize, and embrace the fact that you are in a holy war. And we're going to fight that holy war different than they do, different than their master does, right? Because that's what we're called to do by our master. But regardless, you need to understand you are in a holy war. And if you don't believe me, you don't have teenagers, right? There is a battle within every teenage soul. And for most parents, I'm sure there is a time when it feels like maybe you're losing, right? But there is, if you raise them up in the way that they should be, they will return. They will not depart, right? We know that. So here's the deal. I can be as patriotic as I want to be about America, right? And I can go out and I can wear that uniform. I can carry that flag and I can shoot my gun, but somebody who is empowered by the realization that they are in a holy war is carrying a different mandate. You become more powerful when you realize, when you embrace that you are in a holy war, that you represent a holy army for a holy God, and you've got a holy mission. You will be empowered when you accept that on a daily basis. You will be a force to be reckoned with in the name of Jesus, not for yourself. In the name of Jesus, you will be a force to be reckoned with on this earth, and Satan will know it when you understand, I'm not just, just out here doing my thing. I'm not just out here trying to follow the same rules as any other army. I work for the Almighty God. Amen. So those fighting a holy war should be far more radical. And I don't mean radical like you're ready to do some more savage stuff. I mean, radical and level of commitment, level of understanding. And a holy warrior knows what's exactly at stake. There is no, see, a soldier in a regular army does what he's told because he's told what he needs to know. But we do not have limited information. We have the information at our fingertips. If we don't know, it's because we are not taking the personal responsibility to know exactly what God would have us know to go out there and do. So you're empowered as you can possibly be. And so a war has many battles within a war. And so the battleground within this holy war between heaven and hell is not for land, it's not for property, it's not for riches or even power, but for the most valuable thing God has created which is your eternal soul. So there are billions of battles to be fought, won, and lost. And every soul won is actually a two-point swing. Right? Every time we win a soul, we end up taking another point away from the other team. And so we're in this seemingly eternal game of Red Rover, Red Rover. It's a little more deadly, a little more serious, but that's what it is. But we already know that there's a winner. We already know who the winner is. But we want to we do everything that God called us to do to be a part of that. And we want as many souls on this side that can celebrate and share within the victory when it's time to crown the king. So, and the, Amer the American Civil War is just a really good example for this. If your identity is a southerner, is about to be offended, I apologize. Maybe you need to put on your identity as a Christian. Because we are not fighting a war to win a war. We are fighting a war to end and defeat and free people from slavery. Slavery to sin, slavery to Satan, slavery to the flesh. Amen. So in the background, we saw this with the illustration Pastor Tony gave us in, the, uh, in the, first, the first weekend of the series, right? When, I always mess up Elijah and Elisha. Elisha and his underling is with him. He's like, oh, we're not going to make it. We're surrounded. And Elisha says, you, you don't know, you can't see. And there's, re there's this revealing of all that is going on in the background. Heaven is working on our behalf, just like that situation. We're not left to fend for ourselves. 
So we see heaven's, heaven's works within answered prayers, amen? And sometimes with unanswered prayers, because sometimes we're asking for the wrong stuff, right? Sometimes it's better that God told us no because we don't know what we're asking for, or it's not going to help us in that situation, or it's going to be more comfortable than beneficial. So we, are, we, we see this also in the, the provision of his written word for us to lean on, for us to go back to. We have this resource to seek his wisdom, to seek his heart, to seek his purpose. The word is, it's a powerful tool and a weapon meant especially for equipping the saints. And so within that written word and in our time, we are provided prophecy. We know that we have many books that give us prophecy, and yet we have prophets of today as well. And so that prophecy serves as guidance and reassurance of a couple things. First one is God is with us. Next one, God has a plan. This is not willy-nilly. He's doing something. He told us from the beginning that he's got a plan. He told us he's got it covered. Our problem is in the moment, we are very short-sighted and we, we forget God's got it covered. God is in control of that plan and that we need to trust God's wisdom and foresight over our own understanding and short-sightedness. So that he gave us the church for strength. Brothers and sisters that are called to walk with you in the times of need or fear or stress, he gave us each other to strengthen us. And there's just things that God is protecting us from regularly that we're never going to be aware of because it never even hits our radar. He's deflecting it before it gets in our airspace. By the way, I'm going to end up using a lot of military terms tonight. I'll try and talk through the ones that I don't think are self-explanatory. Please forgive me, but we are talking about war, so we're going to use some military terms. So dominion and authority. So another thing heaven has done on our behalf is granting us the proper authority to carry out our king's will. So the transfer of, of dominion over all earth, this occurred from Adam to Satan. It took place in Genesis. In Genesis 1, the rulership of earth was given to Adam, but in Genesis 3, the rulership of earth was transferred to Satan when Adam chose to sin. And we see this acknowledged by Jesus in the way he does and doesn't respond to Satan when he's in the wilderness. In Luke 4, verses 5 through 7, it says, The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their, all their authority and splendor that has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will be all yours. The way this is addressed and not addressed by Jesus immediately following that is acknowledgement that rulership of earth at that time existed under the control of Satan. And we gave, when I say we, Adam gave it to him. One of us would have screwed it up, even if it wasn't Adam. So, but rulership is regained, rulership of earth is regained by Jesus in Matthew 28, 18. We see it, it says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This was achieved through his sinless life and resurrection, right? So the authority that Jesus had, he has given to his disciples. He's delegated us, delegated us this authority to work within the supernatural, even though we are mere natural beings. We have a supernatural spirit, and we are empowered through that. Because of that, we're going to experience supernatural warfare because we, our souls, they are the target of the battle, the Red Rover, Red Rover. So we're going to constantly feel this spiritual warfare. We are likely to experience spiritual warfare in different ways, different levels for each one of us. It's going to look different. And some of us are going to actually have verbal or physical interactions with the supernatural as a witnessable, in a witnessable way. And you may have interactions with demons or angels that are maybe even speaking to you. Maybe they reveal themselves to you. This is evident in the Bible, and there's plenty of people with that kind of testimony today. There's no reason to believe that that would have stopped. So, And others of us are going to experience that kind of warfare, but it's all going to in occur internally. It's literally going to be just your flesh and your spirit constantly. It will be affected by things on the outside more than likely, but you won't even detect that it's that. You may experience great trials of your flesh, 
and your spirit fighting, but it's, it's the natural fighting the supernatural. We need to embrace the supernatural. So I'm going to ask you a question, are you engaged? And I just, this is not an accusation for anybody, right? But here's the deal. Some of us are going to experience this spiritual warfare. And if you haven't experienced spiritual warfare, again, not an accusation, just something to consider. Is it because maybe you're so unengaged in the battle that Satan doesn't even need to bother with you? And some of you might be thinking, I've had so much warfare, maybe I need to back off a little bit. Don't do that. All right, so I want to talk about methods of warfare. Uh, we're going to go over a couple different topics of warfare as it applies to today's army terms, but yet it applies within your household for that spiritual warfare. And I'm going to go backwards from um, at the highest echelon, the most, the most detrimental down to the earlier stages. And so as, I, as, I, as these pop up on the screen, I want you to take a hard look, maybe even write them down and consider throughout the night, throughout the week, who's winning the battle on, in this avenue, in this sector of the fight, who's winning the battle in my household or within myself. So the first one is cyber, cyber warfare, which is any and all online attacks. So are you, anyone in your ho- are you or anyone in your household under spiritual attack by means of the internet, social media, TV, streaming apps, dating apps, all those things? Are the men or the boys in the room, are they getting caught up visually in things that would trap them? Are the young girls or married women, are they, are they seeking validation through social media versus through their husband or their father? And as leaders in the home, do you maintain a strong firewall, this border of protection, this perimeter? I control what comes in digitally through my house, into my household. Do you have this strong firewall controlling what enters? Are there protections in place? So who is, who is winning the cyber war in your home? Next is psychological operations or information and messaging. So which kingdom is winning the information war in your house? Are more minutes and hours of the day dedicated to godly audio video input into the soul? Or is your time dominated by apathetic or even depraved entertainment that we justify because it's entertaining? Next is special operations. So have you allowed the enemy to sneak in past the perimeter of your home simply because you're not on watch? Has your spiritual border been breached by those who wish to do you and your loved one harms, but you... You didn't even notice because they tiptoed past you. Shaping the battlefield. And what this means is, for, for those unfamiliar with this term, is before an army goes to war, before, it, okay, before we invaded Iraq, we spent days and weeks with our shock and awe campaign, obliterating every possible reported military location with cruise missiles, with field artillery, with Air Force dropping bombs, right? We were shaping the battlefield. We were creating an advantage for ourselves. We were restricting where the enemy could work within. So who's shaping the battlefield in your family, in your household, or within, your, within yourself? Is the outside world dictating the terms by which you operate, how you spend your time, or how you prioritize your life, or where the battle, draw, battle lines are drawn? Are there subjects that are off limits because we're, they're just taboo, we don't talk about them? Or have you taken a proactive approach to close specific doors and windows in your home, limiting the access of the world to your family? That way you can focus on a couple different avenues where they might have to come through. Are you preparing for battle? Are you training for it? Or are you waiting till you're punched in the face to put your mouthpiece in? Are you prayed up? Are you fasting? Are you disciplined? Are these strange and alien terms to you? Do you have verses of scripture memorized that give you courage and strength and, and just give you something to stand on in a moment where you might normally be weak? I know what the Lord has said to me and this Bible verse or this Bible verse or this Bible verse. You see many women these days, will, you know, they'll coat their homes in Bible verses. We, we went over to uh, one of the family's homes as they were building it, and we all took turns writing Bible verses on the two by fours in the framing. 
These Bible verses have, have strength for us within them. So do you have a strong unit of friends and family that will help you stand your ground to walk through the trenches and to go on the offensive versus staying on the defensive? Are you trained to respond spiritually as a reflex or is it typically your last course of action because you feel like you've run out of options? And I feel like this is such an easy one for us to mess up, but yet it's such an easy one for us to correct. We can get this right. We can, we can make sure that prayer is the first thing we do every day, the first thing we do when, we, the, when we're going to walk into a situation we're nervous or uneasy about. Prayer, if it continually becomes the first thing we do in a situation, it will be the first thing we do in a hard situation as well. Building strength, recruitment, right? So you can't win a, win a war if, you, if you're not replenishing your forces. So are you bringing in and bringing up or discipling more and more people that are connected to the Lord and at the same time expelling those that distract or detract from your relationship to the Lord? Diplomacy. So diplomacy is, is a phase of war. It occurs before the first shot is fired, and it typically occurs right before the last shot is fired. Right? But do you attempt to negotiate and be diplomatic with the enemy and, or those that serve him instead of suiting up in the full armor of God and being armed to the teeth for any engagement? In your good nature, have you forgotten that you've been made righteous, that you've been given authority and you've been given power? You've been assigned this a power and authority. Have you forgotten that in your desire to be nice and pleasing to others, do you get steamrolled because you show up at the negotiating table with no knife in your pocket, no gun in a holster, no army behind you? A diplomat at the table is only as strong as the threat of force behind him. Nobody's going to negotiate with somebody who's got nobody on their side. And lastly, patriotism. So, are you and your family patriotic for this kingdom? Are you reinforcing that patriotism for this kingdom? America has a technological advantage in wars, but we don't just win wars because we've got all the best toys. We win wars because this is the land of the free, and we raise up young men and young women who are ready to go lay down their life for their neighbor, for their brother, for their mother, for their father. We raise up people who value this country, who value this kingdom, and as Christians, we should be doing the same thing. If churches die when we don't bring in the next generation, with no rockfish kids, rockfish is dead in 20 years. Are you bringing up that patriotism for your kingdom in your home? Do your kids see it from you Monday through Saturday, or is it for an hour and a half on Sunday? Kids are, especially teenagers, very, very perceptive on what's going on in the household and what's going on outside the household. And if what's going on outside the household, inside church, doesn't marry up with what's going on inside the household, the kids know it. They detect the hypocrisy. They detect the, the wavering, the uncertainty, the, the flakiness of the parents, whatever you want to call it. Whatever the cause is, they can detect it. As early as probably six or seven years old, they can pick up on the difference between mom and dad, maybe even a little earlier. But well, by the time they're teenagers, then they're lawyering up and they got, they got all this ammo. Well, you told me I got to follow these rules, but you only do this from 1030 to 1 o'clock on Sunday, so I'm not doing it like you're not doing it. So are we, are we embracing this patriotism seven days a week, 24 hours a day, for our children, for their benefit, for our grandchildren? Next, we'll talk about strategic and tactical moves. The difference between two, there's three. When we talk about warfare, there is strategic, which is top-level decisions and movements. There's operational, 
And then there's tactical. We're going to skip operational. So there's a clear line of separation here. So strategic moves are usually proactive, while tactical moves are usually reactive to the situation. Strategic moves allow you to dictate the terms of your interactions with the enemy, while tactical moves are made when the enemy is in your face. Strategic moves allow you to stay multiple moves ahead, while tactical moves are made by those who can't see what's coming. Strategic moves are made by those who know that conflict with the enemy is inevitable, and tactical moves are made by those who hoped conflict would pass them by. Strategic moves are made by those who understand the intent and capability of their enemy. They have a full understanding of their enemy. Tactical moves are made by those who overlook and don't recognize a threat until it's too late. So I want to finish on some, some tips on how to be strategic versus how to be tactical in this spiritual warfare. And so the first one is to obviously keep the spirit engaged in prayer and fasting. Don't let these be foreign things to you. Don't these be, let these things be once a year. It should be regular. That way when you need to go to it, it's a reflex. So maintaining this vertical connection through prayer and conversation with God. Fasting to train the spirit over flesh frequently. Sometimes that just means skipping lunch. I'm guilty of not doing that. So know the word of God. So if I'm in a, in a moment of terror, fear, uncertainty, I don't know what I'm going to do. I shouldn't be running from my Bible. Let me find a good verse to lean on. I should know what I need to know ahead of time. Your Bible is there for you to read it now, not for you to read it tomorrow. You can't be expected to memorize it all, to know it all, but you should know where you find strength, where you find encouragement, where you find what makes you resilient in spiritual warfare. And it doesn't need to be the same as anybody else's verses out there. It can be cliche. It doesn't matter. If it's the word of God and it gives you strength, and you're not misusing it for some excuse to do something, use it. So next is closing doors. And so Pastor Tony usually says we want to avoid the kooky stuff. It might sound a little kooky, but look, this stuff's just real. So a couple of years ago, um, five, maybe six years ago, we had an incident in the house um, one of our, our children was detecting something. I can't vouch for what it was. I didn't see it or hear it myself. Point is, they told us, hey, for the last two weeks, I've been too embarrassed and ashamed to tell you I've been seeing this figure in my room, in my closet, and when I see it, I'm paralyzed in fear, and I can't go anywhere. And I don't know what to do about it, and I figured that if I told you that you would think I'm crazy, These things exist. It feels really goofy and really odd to be just a dad in that situation, having, having never dealt with that. We came before the leadership. We said, we, like, hey, we need some guidance for this. You know, we don't deal with boogeymen every day. What do we do? And, you know, I grew up Catholic, and we, we watched all those movies in the 80s and 90s where you always go get the priest, and they come, and they, you know, cast out the demon, and they do this, and you exercise, all that stuff, right? So, we come to the church. We seek the eldership for guidance. Here's the deal. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you've been given authority, you've been given power, and you believe it, you have a weapon, you have a tool, you have protection. You are the spiritual household priest. Don't get me wrong. There are brothers and sisters here that may join you in your home but it is more servicing to you to tell you, you are empowered. Go cleanse your home. Go cast out that demon, whatever it may be. Go get some oil. Coat up your doorposts. Say some prayers. Yell the name of Jesus. And it, man, it's funny because we went through it a couple times. And by the, I think the, maybe the third week, um, we just button heads in the house, right? And so I'm just lecturing one kid, trying to be gentle with it, but just lecturing, like, you're doing this and this and this and this, and none of this is helping, right? None of this is helping. Meanwhile, 
the one who had been in fear for a couple weeks and didn't even say anything, is now walking around the house, rooms away. Actually, so you know, it was, it, they were actually in the room upstairs over the garage. So a good 56 feet away from me, 50, 60 feet away from me, easy, doors in between us, and I could just hear them yelling, get out of my house in the name of Jesus. Amen. It is funny and yet so amazing to hear your kids do that because they believe what they're supposed to believe because they have accepted the power over that situation. And in truth be told, that child was the only one who could see that thing at the time anyway, so they're the only one that could tell us whether it's gone or not. So again, didn't mean to sound kooky. These things happen to some people. You may never experience it. I'm not trying to tell you it's coming. But first tip is closing doors. We want to we want to avoid the stuff in the occult that may bring that in. And if you're not familiar with the occult, here's my other tip for you. Don't go looking for what is the occult because you will get sucked into a black hole on YouTube and Google giving you all kinds of information you don't need to know. I am a, in the army. I was an intelligence analyst. It was my job to know the enemy. When this situation occurred in my household, it was my nature to probably spend over a month, maybe over two months, researching and wanting to know all I could know. But here's the deal. If you know who gives you power, who gives you authority, who gives you the responsibility to take care of your own home, you don't need to know all that much about the enemy. You don't need to go digging through all these little tools he has to work himself into your home. You just need to be proactive about being focused on Jesus, and you don't have to worry about what's coming in because Jesus has you. Okay, so don't go pursuing information on the occult because it's going to somehow empower you. Jesus empowers you. So that means no tarot cards, no palm reading, no Ouija boards, no seances, no mediums, no white magic, no black magic. Okay, none of, none of this. Well, I'm just a white witch stuff, right? None of that stuff. Demonic entertainment. So this is actually a great month to bring this up because every streaming service and every uh, cable TV channel is showing you Halloween and Friday the 13th and all those other stupid movies with demonic figures in them that you just can't kill because they're just so evil. Cut this stuff out of your life if you're watching it. Right? And don't sit at home and watch the TV Lucifer because he's not that bad and it's a good show. Are you serious? It's, it's titled Lucifer. Have some common sense. If it's garbage, it's garbage. I shouldn't have to tell you that. What? That's right. I thought you were going to argue with me. All right. So spiritual affiliation. So avoid and break ties to the groups that have spiritual affiliations. So I'm going to bring up something that, that may bother some of the men here. Masons, Freemasons. There are spiritual ties to that organization. I am not telling you that because you went and became a Mason or because your father was a Mason or your brother's a Mason that you're going to hell. Jesus overrides all things. Okay? But what I'm telling you is if you are tied to Jesus and you are tied to Freemasons and any other spiritual organization, you are jamming up that frequency to Jesus. Amen. You need to break free of that. I'm telling you, whatever good the Masons do, it's tied to something evil. I'm not the expert on that. I'm not going to spend an hour and a half debating it with you. I have a gentleman here that I can point you to that will educate you on how to break those ties if you want to break those ties. Amen. And lastly, syncretism. So this is the blending of religious practices or, um, uh, yeah, practices. Anything religious, right? So trying to, trying to blend Christianity with certain things in yoga. I'm not going to tell you you can't do any yoga poses, lady. If you want to be fit, do yoga. But there's a certain way to do it and a certain way not to do it. I'm not the expert on that. Sorry. But one of the, one of the uh, other than yoga, one of the common things around here is we, we have a pretty significant um, Native American population around here. And hey, if, you're, if you've got Native American blood in you, heritage... I salute you, good. I'm not saying anything bad about Native American heritage, bloodline, nothing like that. But there are practices within the Native American culture which are considered religious. And if you are doing those, and at the same time claiming Jesus Christ, you are in conflict with yourself. You cannot blend the practices of two religions 
Not, there is, like I told you before, there is no, what I say? Dual citizenship with heaven. You cannot be doing religious things of another religion and Christianity. It is in conflict. So I'd urge you to stop practicing those things. I'm not asking you to cut ties with, with family members or denounce your, your heritage. So please don't take offense. I want, you to, I want you to practice your Christianity safely and wisely. So I think we've covered the forces of heaven and hell are, are hard at work here, visible and invisible in our world right now. The devil, here's the difference, the devil doesn't take a day off. God gave us a Sabbath, but the devil doesn't take a day off. But I promise you, your God can do more in six days than the devil can do in 14, Amen. let alone seven. Amen. So be prepared for the spiritual warfare. Be trained up. Be patriotic about your kingdom. Have your armor on, as discussed last week. Know how to fight strategically. Don't be surprised when it comes your way. Be ready for it. Go straight to prayer. Go straight to your brothers and sisters. Seek strength within the church. Seek strength within guidance from the church. Wise man seeks good counsel. Be encouraged that God is in the supernatural working on the situation just as we saw with Elisha in that moment. It is the same for us here and now. Trust in his sovereignty. So that's it for tonight. I hope it was beneficial. I hope it helped. Let's, uh, let's pray. Let's get you guys home safe. <laughs> Father God, we thank you for showing up and delivering something to us today. Lord, we pray that this would that this rest on our hearts, Lord, that we rest in our souls, that we would not forget it in our mind, Lord, that when we reach for the remote to turn on, TV we shouldn't be watching that might let something creep into the household. Instead, we would, we would turn it off, Lord, and, and we would pick up our Bibles, even if for a minute and a half, Lord. We would do something. We would go straight to you in the moments we are tempted, tempted to deviate in a different direction, Lord, that we would circle back to you. I pray that you would pull us in, you would make us more like you, that you would get each brother and sister here home safe tonight, that you would wake them tomorrow, that our pastors would arrive ready to do and lead this church starting tomorrow, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.